With that, I will uh, turn it over to Tom McMillan and Flight 93, the story, the aftermath and the legacy of American courage on 9-11. Well, Randall, thank you so much. It's uh, great to be here. It's great to meet you a few weeks ago and a few of you other folks at the at the Civil War uh, seminar. I didn't expect I'd get a Flight 93 talk out of it, but it's, it's great. Just really impressed with the work you're doing with the, the Military and Veterans Museum. And, and I really do think in some ways that these folks above uh, on Flight 93 kind of became their own military unit. They became kind of a militia unit that in the skies who are Western Pennsylvania. So there's, there's really a tie there. Um, the one thing, the, the, the thing I didn't expect, the challenge that I didn't expect uh, writing this book is there is a difference in a challenge to writing contemporary history. Most history we think of is 100, 200 years ago, the Civil War, for instance. Um, where people have no immediate memory of it. You know, last, there were some older members at the, at the Civil War talk a few weeks ago, but no, no one was alive during the Civil War. So you don't have those contemporary members. It's different here because people, the, the vast majority of our audience did remember and, and did read and did listen. And so you have this, as an author, you have this battle between history and memory, history being what happened and memory being you know, I read this somewhere, I saw it on CNN, or I saw it on NBC, or even worse, I saw it, I read it on the internet. Uh, and, and so they're, you know, they're affected, uh, people are affected by what they, what they see and read. In addition, we as people have short attention spans. If you're like me, uh, after 9-11, you probably consumed everything for about a week to 10 days. I read every story, watched every special, but then about September 20th, I mean, life moves on and you, you have to move on. And, I learned way back in journalism school in the 70s that often reporting early in disasters and tragedies is incorrect. It's, it's not the fake news stuff. It's just that even the authorities don't know what's happened. So the reporters having to speculate and piece things together. So a, a lot of the stuff that, that was reported in those first seven to 10 days was incorrect. Um, it eventually got corrected. But sometimes that took weeks or months or years and people weren't paying attention. So the one of the challenges that I had is these perceptions that people have, some big and small about this story, you have to deal with as, a, as an author. I'll just touch on a couple of those before we really get into the story. Uh, one is that the hijackers attacked with box cutters. Widely reported, if you watched any of the videos, of, you know, the 20th anniversary videos last year, they all talked about it. I used to think, you know, I certainly wouldn't want to be cut by a box cutter, but I was trying to figure out how they hijacked four planes with box cutters. And in fact, they didn't. They had knives. They, uh, the FBI found 14 receipts for knives that, that the hijackers purchased. They studied our system. They knew, as, as we did, or at least I didn't, on September 11th, 2001, it was legal to carry a knife blade up to four inches on a plane. Perfectly legal. They went to stores like Lowe's and Home Depot and they bought those multi-wave tools, Leatherman multi-wave tools. You can still buy them today with eight or 10 or 12 blades. So people say, how'd they get those knives on the plane? They put them in their pockets and walked on legally. So, so that's one of the things. The other is all this reporting that people made calls from the planes on cell phones. And this led to a lot of controversy, a lot of conspiracy theories. You can't make cell phone calls from 35,000 feet. Well, there were, there's one famous call from Flight 93, but there were 37 calls made from Flight 93. Two of them were from cell phones. 35 of them were from air phones, the seat back air phones that used to be on planes. The kids have no idea what they are. What they are. These are now video screens. There was one for every three seats. If you remember them, you flew at that, that area. And you could pull the, the, you know, the phone out, run your credit card through it, and make a call from 35,000 feet. Hey, I'm in the air. Or, hey, my, you know, the plane's late. I'm going to be late for a meeting. It was very important, a, a factor of how the FBI figured out as much as we know what happened on Flight 93, though, because those calls all left records. We know who made the call, or at least who paid for it with a credit card. We know where it went, we know how long it lasted, and really importantly, we know where the person was sitting. Were they sitting in 23 or row 23 or row 32? So we can see how far back the hijackers pushed the passengers and crew. But if you lay it out, and I did this one day at a conference from my, my office when I was working, you lay it out, you can see who was sitting next to whom as they're making calls. So you can kind of figure out who was, who was plotting together. And the third one, I always have to be a little careful about this. There is one name that most people associate with the story of Flight 93, one name and one phrase, Todd Beamer, let's roll. 
I've heard it once. I've heard it a thousand times. Todd Beamer, let's roll. Todd Beamer, let's roll. Todd Beamer, let's roll. And people, most people I encounter, including out at the memorial, think that is the essence of the story of Flight 93. Folks, that is not the essence of the story of Flight 93. Todd Beamer was a hero. He was part of the group that did the counterattack. But he was only one of many heroes. I don't even think he was the leader. I actually think the leader was the man from Minnesota named Tom Burnett. But it doesn't really matter who was the leader. This was a group effort. But so I had to try to figure out as a journalist, how did this happen? How did the story become so prominent that Todd Beamer became the guy? And, and I, I looked at it. And somebody, somebody, we could, uh, we could uh, mute ourselves there. We could, we could hear some noise here. Um, how did Todd Beamer become the guy? Well, there were three people on board the plane uh, that made calls, basically said, we're going to take back the plane. Tom Burnett and Jeremy Glick called their wives. It's a very key point of this. Todd Beamer did try to place a call to his wife in Cranberry, New Jersey. The call dropped in a second or two, no conversation. We don't know if he thought better of it or it's just bad technology. But then he hit zero and he got a Verizon operator in Chicago named Lisa Jefferson. And that is the conversation that went down in American lore. It's, it's hard to remember now, but on September 11th, in those first 24 hours, we didn't know why that plane crashed in Shanksville. We knew it was part of the attack, but there was a story of why it was there. It wasn't until the next day that stories started to get out that something may have happened on board. So reporters are looking for those stories. Well, Dina Burnett and Liz Glick were not doing interviews on September 12th. They were mourning the deaths of their husbands and the fathers of their young children. But Lisa Jefferson, though traumatized, uh, didn't know Todd Beamer before she picked up that phone. So she was able to do the interview. And it's the first, I remember that day. It's the first in this darkest day of my lifetime. You heard this story of the Amer these American guys fought back and the passengers fought back. And what a dramatic story it was. And this young man, he said, let's roll. It became the defining story. President Bush invited his wife to the White House. And so it, be it became, it, is, it now almost overwhelms the story of Flight 93. So I want to remind people, Todd Beamer, very much a hero, but in, in context, he's been given an outsized role. There were, there were a lot of heroes to this story, and I, I, I want people to go away thinking of that. It wasn't just a story about one man and, and one leader. So to the story, if you were in the Newark airport on Tuesday morning, September 11th, 2001, and you walked past gate 17, you would have seen 33 regular passengers, seven crew members getting ready for what they thought was a normal flight to the West Coast. United Airlines, Flight 93, Newark to San Francisco. The manifest was the same as any of the, at the Minneapolis airport today. There were businessmen and grandparents and college students uh, flying for the reasons we all fly, going to a conference, going on vacation, going home. Uh, one man had been east for his grandmother's 100th birthday party. One lady had been east for her grandmother's funeral. Three college students were east visiting friends before the bulk of their classes uh, started. So again, most people know one name, Minnesotans certainly know the name Tom Burnett, but most people aboard this flight are very anonymous still to this day. So I like to do a little introduction early to just for the types of people who are on this flight to give you the kind of the sense of every man that we feel. Uh, the young, lower right hand corner, Deora Bodley was the youngest person aboard Flight 93. Deora was 20 years old. She's from San Diego. She was about to enter her junior year at Santa Clara University up near San Francisco. She'd been east visiting friends in Connecticut and New Jersey. She actually was scheduled on a flight later that afternoon. Her mom told me she was very excited. She called and was able to get on an earlier flight. I can get on flight 93 and get back to campus early. There were a lot of those stories about this flight tragically. Upper left, Hilda Marson is by contrast, the oldest person aboard flight 93. Hilda is 79 years old. Uh, not a Native American, uh, born in Germany, came to the U.S. with her parents when she was six years old through Ellis Island, that whole routine, did not speak a word of English, became as American as you could be, married a man who was a welder and a policeman. They raised two daughters in the, in the New York, New Jersey area. She worked uh, her whole life as a bookkeeper and a teacher's aide. But Hilda wasn't going on vacation. She was actually moving. Life comes full circle. She had packed three suitcases. She was moving to San Francisco to move in with her adult daughter. Uh, just below her lower left, John Talignani, also in his 70s, US Army veteran of the World War II era, born in Italy, grew up in the United States, owned the pizzeria in New York City, was a bartender, told great stories. But he was traveling with a, he a heavy heart. Imagine this, John's son, Sepson, had been married 
that had gone to California on his honeymoon and was killed in an auto accident on his honeymoon. So John was actually flying to the funeral and collect the remains to bring it back. What, imagine what that, that family went through. And upper right, Wanda Green is obviously a flight attendant, one of five flight attendants aboard Flight 93. She was a 29 year veteran of United Airlines. Uh, like a lot of us, some of you may have done the same thing for 29 years looking for something else. She, she was dabbling in real estate, dreamed of opening her own real estate office. She actually was scheduled to fly on September 13th. She had a house closing that day. She asked, asked her boss for a change in schedule. And that's how she got on to a Flight 93 on September 11th. Now, they and the others uh, boarded in a, in a timely fashion. The plane was scheduled to take off at 8 o'clock. It pulled back from the gate at 8.01. For anyone there who's flown out of the New York area airports, that's not bad. That's almost on time, 8.01. But then it just sat there. It sat on the tarmac and the runway for almost 45 minutes. And that delay is absolutely crucial in the September 11th timeline. That plane had taken off anywhere near on time. Uh, we'd be telling a completely different story today, I believe. Because there were four men on that plane, as we know now, who knew they weren't going home. Uh, they were part of a 19-man Al-Qaeda crew tasked with hijacking four planes that day and crashing them into buildings that uh, exemplified American dominance, economic, political, military. Here are the four flights. Well, look at those. For me. Look at the times. They're all going to take off between 7.45 and 8.10. Very tight time frame of 25 minutes. This was going to happen so fast that no one, not the FAA, not the military, not the people on board could have done it. You can see they're all east coast to west coast, heavy fuel loads, huge explosions if you hit a building. What you can't see is that they're all also 757s or 767s, which have almost identical cockpits. And that was crucial because the hijacker pilots, they, they'd never flown big commercial airliners before, but they practiced on simulators of 757s or 767s. So it had to be those flights. So this was very intricate planning. They didn't come up with this plan on September 2nd. This was weeks and months, and in some cases, years in the, in the planning stages. The idea was that each plane would have a five-man hijacker crew. One hijacker pilot, these men had been in the U.S. for at least a year, learning to fly small planes, getting their small plane licenses at schools in, in Florida and, and Arizona, and then practicing on simulators for the 757s and 767s. And four muscle hijackers on each. Two who would attack the cockpit, take out the pilot first officer, and two who would then force the rest of the passengers and crew to the back of the plane create that sterile area around the cockpit. I'll only show this slide briefly, but here are the Flight 93 hijackers. And what do you notice in context of what I just said? There are only four. There were supposed to be five. There are only four. Al-Qaeda could not get the 20th hijacker into the country. Nine men were nominated. One made it all the way to uh, Orlando, Florida in early August. But a very alert immigration official thought, you know, the man didn't speak English, didn't know where he was going, didn't have a plane ticket, he, he, he sounded suspicious, didn't let him in. So these guys only had four. Now, that reduction in manpower may have been part of another key delay that day, is that these guys took longer than they were supposed to to hijack the plane. Here is a uh, cockpit of a 757. The, the idea, as we know from two plotters who were still in Guantanamo, was that they were supposed to hijack the plane within 15 minutes. Now, that was probably unrealistic and only happened on one of the flights, but the other three all did it within 30 minutes, pretty quickly, pretty efficiently from their perspective. These guys took 46 minutes. We'll never know the reason for that delay. You know, the hijacker pilot, Zia Jara, had gone home that summer. He might have been wavering. We, we're, we're not quite sure, but, but uh, there, there was a delay. Um, they hijack the plane at 928. So it takes off at 842. They, they hijack at 928. It's almost over the, the, the uh, Pennsylvania, Ohio border. How do we know 928? Two things. Uh, this was the only flight because it didn't hit a building where they recovered both black boxes. So the flight data recorder, the National Transportation Safety Board, was able to do a simulation of the flight path. It's, it's, it's available online. At 928, there's a dramatic dip in altitude. But also, one of the pilots, either the pilot or the co-pilot, at the time of the attack, keyed the microphone. And air traffic control in Cleveland heard the struggle. They hear, mayday, mayday, get out of here, get out of here. There's about a 30-second struggle for control as the hijackers come in with their knives and, and, and take over the plane. Now, 
Very quickly, the rest of the passengers and crew are pushed to the back of the plane. And here is a, here is a shot of, of a runway, of, a, of, of the aisle of 757. There you can see uh, the seat back air phones, but look at that narrow aisle. So they're pushed to the back of the plane. Almost immediately, within two minutes at 9.30, the calls start, the calls start. There were, you know, again, there's one famous call, but 12 people made 35 calls from air phones. And that's really, uh, those calls are how we know what we know about what happened on, on, on Flight 93. Now, the technology wasn't great, but 20 of them dropped off almost immediately. No conversation would take place, but, but 15 got through. And that's where we got, that's where we get our information. The one thing that happened, though, was that, that, of course, the passengers and crew were thinking they're just reporting a hijacking to their loved ones. They're terrified, maybe saying goodbye. The unintended consequence is they got information back. For a timeline of that day, the first plane hit the first tower at 846. We all thought it was reported. If you look at the YouTube videos of the coverage now, everybody thought that was an accident. Second plane hits at 903, that big fireball on live TV. Then we know we're under attack. This plane isn't hijacked till 928. They're calling at 930. The loved ones have been watching television for more than a half hour. So they report to them that two planes have hit the World Trade Center. Imagine what must have been going through their heads. I mean, everybody in America that day at that point knew a terrorist hijackings were going on, except the people aboard Flight 93. They would have thought they were the only ones. I can't imagine what those, what those images uh, would have looked like as you know as as they're as they're taking those calls. Now, Randall, I said you know you said you wanted me to stop briefly to see if anybody had any questions up to this point. We certainly could do questions afterwards too. But if anybody has a question up to this point before I pick up the rest of the story, uh, I'd be I'd be happy to to take one or two. If anybody has a question, you're welcome to to ask it directly um, or enter it into the chat. I suppose um, I've got uh, a question. Um, can you, in your book, you kind of clarify um, the term muscle hijacker, where it came from, what it actually means. Um, can you speak to that, please? Yes. Uh, it's, a, it's definitely a misnomer when you think of the size of these guys. Uh, the, one of the things that surprised me when I, when I was uh, researching this, my, they did provide the muscle. They were the, they were the attackers. They had the knives. They attacked the cock, but they pushed people back. These were not big, strong, physical, imposing men. Most of them were between five seven and five nine inches tall. Uh, two of them were five feet five. They weren't very heavy. They were they, uh, they had come over. They started working in gyms that that afternoon, but they weren't big, overpowering guys. What they had, however, was uh, the element of surprise. They they had weapons. They had the element of surprise, and obviously the willingness to die. Those combinations gave them, as we, as we realized, the edge in the fight. But I often think, as we'll get to the size of some of the passengers later, what, what they must have think is some of these guys who are 6'2", 225, are walking to their seats. Um, so the, when you hear the word muscle hijacker, that's what they, the FBI came up with that. I understand what they were saying, but it gives you the impression that these were big brutes of guys, and, and, and they were not. Uh, I think the, the, the tallest of the, of the hijackers was 5'10", and that man was very thin. And could you speak briefly about the light load that day? Uh, not many passengers aboard. Yeah, light load all those days. It's hard to explain to people these days, especially young people, uh, that planes flew back then with, uh, with so few people on board. Uh, they were, the airlines just moved planes around the country. So basically, if you count the hijackers who were, who were registered, uh, there were 44 people aboard this plane, which held more than 180. It was the lightest load of all four. But the high, again, to their research, uh, Randall, they had researched uh, airline tables and flights. They had taken the uh, sample flights. They knew that Tuesday mornings were light business travel loads. They specifically chose Tuesday morning because they thought there would be. They didn't want to hijack a plane with 180 people on it. This was ideal with only 40 people. Some of the other flights maybe had 50 or 60, but, but there, there weren't huge crowds. So they, they basically guessed, but they guessed correctly that those uh, flights would not have a, a pig passenger loads. Now, you know, we all, I always, you know, joke with friends, if you have that few people now, they would come up, the airline would come up with, there's a mechanical error and your plane can't take up. But so it, again, you explain to, to, with 20 years, especially to young people, uh, that this flight with 40 people would not have taken off today. Uh, but it was, it was just a different time back then. And uh, they were just moving planes around the country. So good questions though. Thank you. 
and and not to foreshadow things too much, but it's also a day that there's a joint session of Congress going on. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, they they when you look back at it, it's it's maddening. It's maddening how well they researched us. They took advantage of the open society, the open records, and 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 took advantage of that clearly. So that's why I said, you know, this wasn't something that was planned in, in a week or two. This was very meticulous planning. Uh, it, it took, and, and, and to me, it, it it underscores though how what an amazing job the passengers and crew did because they had basically 30 minutes to untangle a plot that had been two years in the making. They had no idea. These people are just getting on a plane to fly to the West Coast. They have no idea they're walking into history. The hijackers knew what was going to happen. So they, they had every edge, and yet these folks were able to do what they did. It makes it even, when you think of how, uh, uh, you know, some, to, to the extent that the book's ever gotten criticism, it's the, there's too much on the hijackers. But as a historian, you have to write the full story. They, they, I mean, September 11th doesn't happen without the hijackers. But that's the biggest lesson, I think, though. They, they planned so meticulously. And yet these people, only given 30 minutes, were still able to do what, what they did. It, it, it's, a, it's a phenomenal accomplishment. Uh, they didn't succeed in their ultimate goal. But uh, but they, they did strike back and, and foil the plan, and this plane did not hit the Capitol building. Just one more question for now, please, Tom. Uh, sure. Looking to our our, our chat, um, hope, wondering if you couldn't please speak to Zacharias Musawi. Yes. Okay. Uh, someone who really knows, uh, of course, the Minnesota connection. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there, Zacharias Musawi was an Al Qaeda member who was detained in 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 August. Uh, was at a flight school in Minneapolis. Uh, and raised some suspicion because he paid with cash. Uh, he had, did not have small plane license and wanted to fly big planes. And allegedly, I don't know if this was actually true. This was kind of a, a, a legend that he said uh, he didn't need to take off or land. I don't know whether that happened. We actually said that or not. But he was very suspicious. A very alert FBI, very alert FBI agent from Minnesota reported that to headquarters. Um, they did not think they had enough to look, open his laptop. I mean, if they had gone into his laptop, they might have, they would have found some connections of people in this plot. Um, he was, for the early first few years, he was reported as the 20th hijacker, as though he was the guy who was gonna be the 20th man on this flight. That was not the case. If you look at this, he was practicing to be a pilot. One of the working theories, and we'll never know, is they were so afraid that, that Ziad Jarrah, the, the hijacker pilot on Flight 93, was going to back out, that Masawi may have been an emergency backup just in case. He was following all the same protocols that the hijacker pilots did. And then later, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who was the, you know, the, the mastermind for bin Laden, said he was then going to be part of a second wave. You know, whether that's true or not, uh, we don't know. But, but Masawi wasn't trained as well as these other guys, and he made a lot of slip-ups, thankfully. Uh, but you know that that very alert Minnesota uh, FBI agent uh, never really got her due as a whistleblower because I think if headquarters had looked into that, you know there, there are a lot of what ifs, but they would have certainly gotten connections to some of the people back in Afghanistan and in Germany who were part of this plot. So you know, uh, you never know. But he he wasn't really he wasn't a twentieth hijacker. I think he, I think they were worried about Jara and he was going to be an emergency backup pilot if if Jara backed up. And I think the Katani who was turned away in Florida was presumed to be perhaps the 20th. Yes, hijacker. yes. He, he's, um, he almost certainly was going to be the 20th. He would have been on this, on this plane. And again, they didn't, they didn't train him as well as they did these other guys. See, the other guys were all able to get through. And he just, you know, uh, it still took a very alert immigration officer to, to send Katani back. And he, he eventually was uh, arrested in, uh, or uh, taken prisoner in Tora Bora with Bin Laden. So he was, uh, he is uh, at, at Guantanamo now still. He would have I been the 20th. That. And, you know, who, if they have a fifth guy, who knows? Does that make a difference aboard Flight 93? I don't know. We, we can't answer. But it is a little curious that the flight with the one hijacker pilot who they were worried most about was wavering a little bit than had the smallest crew. Never, we've never been able to get an explanation for why that happened. But uh, that was the case. All right, move us forward, please, sir. Okay, back to the play. We were talking about uh, the, the passengers and crew making those calls. And a lot of calls made in the first 10 minutes or so, but the loved ones who, who talk about those calls, and these calls were not recorded, folks. There were three people who did leave voice messages when their calls didn't get through on the old answer machines that we have, but the actual calls were not recorded. We have the testimony of the loved ones. 
And the first 10 minutes or so, the loved ones do not talk about any talk about taking back a plane. It was just exchanging information, bewildering, saying goodbye. It's not really until the third plane hits the Pentagon that they get galvanized and they know they have to do something. Uh, then it's more than the World Trade Center. You have to guess the time you hear that plane hit the Pentagon at about 9.37. Oh, they wouldn't, the, the people on board wouldn't have found out immediately. By the time that gets reported by the news networks and Dina Burnett and, and uh, Liz Glick tell their husbands, it's probably about, uh, you know, 9.45. Uh, so they then, if you look at the timeline here, have 10 or 12 minutes to, to decide what they were going to do. To, to, to come up with, with their plan. Only 10 or 12 minutes to figure this out. Again, against this plot that had been years in the making. We'll just take a brief uh, break here for you to see the, uh, people get mesmerized by this. So I'm gonna stop talking for a little bit. As you see, this is the entire flight path. You can see the little locations, um, you know, where it was when the other planes hit and the probable takeover right over the Pennsylvania, Ohio border, turns around about Cleveland and, uh, and, and heads back. We know the counterattack begins at 9.57. So they have, they have 10 or 12 minutes to come up with their plan. We don't know exactly what that plan was. We don't even know exactly who took part, but with, from research and personalities, I'm really confident that these six people for sure were involved. Upper left-hand corner, Jeremy Glick. Jeremy was six feet one, 215 pounds. He was a former national judo champion at the University of Rochester. Internet sales man, but certainly a guy you'd want on your side if, if you were in a fight. Tom Burnett from Minnesota, 6'2", 205, former high school quarterback, went to the state finals, uh, nominated for the Air Force Academy, chose to go into business, CEO of his company, about to become CEO leadership every step of the way. I really think Tom Burnett was the leader of this crew. Uh, Mark Bingham, upper right-hand corner, 6'4", 225. You start to get a little uh, trend here of the, the physical nature of these. These were big athletic guys. Bingham was a two-time uh, national rugby champion at Cal Berkeley. He was, he was a wild man. He dove off cliffs. He ran with the Bulls in Pamplona. Rugby teammates said uh, he was like a missile going down the field. Uh, lower left, Todd Beamer. He's six feet, 200, small, uh, small college athletic star, baseball and basketball at Wheaton College in Illinois. Joey ne uh, Necky, middle of the bottom row. Joey did not make a call. Hey, folks, 13 people overall, kind of the cell phones made calls. That means 27 didn't. We'll never know those stories. Much in the same way, we can never know the full story of D-Day because so many guys died on that beach. We can never know the full story of Pickett's Charge because so many guys died on that field. Same thing here. Now, Joey's family told I've come to know uh, his brother is a Baltimore police officer, speaking of a friend of mine, said he never would have called us. He never would have worried us. That would have been my reaction. Folks, I, I hope none of us are involved in this. I can tell you that the family members I've talked to who got phone calls are much more comforted that they heard from their loved ones. There's just a mystery for those who didn't call. But again, Joey's family said he, he just wouldn't have bothered us. So why do I think he was involved? You can look at personalities. He's 5'9", 200 pounds, barrel-chested weightlifter, loud, gruff, told his wife, no one will ever take me down without a, without a, fight, without a fight. His brother is a blue-collar Baltimore County police officer, a good friend of mine. It's said to be just like Joey. Joey just doesn't strike me as the kind of guy who would say, you guys go, you guys go ahead and attack the cockpit. I'm going to sit here. You let me know how that goes. You can just kind of tell people, probably the people in, in, on this group, know if this, something happened, they would be front and center. I believe he would, he would have been there. And Don Green, lower right, we'll get to him in, in just a minute. Now, the counterattack, uh, we know, begins at 957. How do we know that? Uh, two things. Uh, there were two ladies who were on the phone, passenger to her mother in New Jersey and a flight attendant to her husband in Florida. They both cut off their calls at 957. One says, I've got to go. Everybody's running the first class. The other says, I've got to go. They're all rushing toward the cockpit. So we have that evidence. We also have from the cockpit voice recorder, which was recovered. Again, the plane did not hit a building. In the cockpit in Arabic, Zia Jarrah, the pilot at 957 says, what's that, a fight? A fight? They can hear the commotion going on back there, as, as these guys, probably led by Jeremy Glick, the, uh, the black belt of judo, are taking down uh, the muscle hijackers. There's a lot of commotion going on. Uh, they, of course, go down that narrow aisle. They're making progress. And then you can see on the, 
on, on the animation of the flight path, Ziad Jarrah, the pilot, starts to rock the wings 30 degrees in each direction. You ever been on a plane with a little bit of turbulence and you have to try to go to the bathroom, how hard it is to keep your footing? Imagine on a plane where the wings are going 30 degrees each direction and a pilot who doesn't know what he's doing. Now, only the family members and one trial jury have ever heard that cockpit voice recorder, but the FBI did a very detailed transcript, which I was able to get uh, obtained from my research. And they talk about loud crashing. I mean, it must have been, you can imagine there must have been luggage coming out of the overhead compartments, banging down plates, crashing glass. It must have been terrifying. And, and it, it stopped the, the passengers and crew in their counterattack for a while. But, but Gerard has to get to his target. He, he can't keep doing this. So he levels the plane out and they move forward. They, they head toward the cockpit. For context, uh, the plane crashes at 10.03. So the, the fight goes from 9.57 to 10.03, about six minutes. Just after 10 o'clock on the, the transcript of the voice recorder, an English, a native English voice, one of the passengers says, in the cockpit, if we don't, we'll die. Think of that. Think of what that means. In the cockpit, if we don't, we'll die. I always stop here to say, you know, we as Americans have a way of, and I'm like this too, we take accurate historic uh, stories and build legends and myths on top of them, make them even greater than they are. It's a very American thing to do. How many times have you heard the passengers and crew of Flight 93 brought down that plane to save lives? They crashed that plane to save those people in the cabin. Well, that's what happened. But listen to what they said, their own testimony. In the cockpit, if we don't, we'll die. To me, that means they had an alternative to dying. Don Green, lower right corner, was a licensed pilot. He was licensed to fly small planes. He had no more knowledge of flying a 757 than Zia Gerard did, but he understood aviation. He'd been in the cockpit. He understood the terminology. He worked for a company. He was an executive for a company that, that supplied airplane parts. There was another passenger aboard who earlier in his, Sonny Garcia, earlier in his career in life, had done eight years of air traffic control for the California Air National Guard. These guys understood aviation. I mean, five of us could try to attack the cockpit. If we, nobody knows how to fly the plane, what's the difference? These guys had that chance. I believe that that's what they were trying to do. And I believe that that's what that meant in the cockpit if we don't, we'll die. I think they wanted to get Don Green into the, into the cockpit. Uh, the, uh, Paul Greengrass, who did the story, the movie United 93, came up with the same conclusion. I think that's what they were trying to do. Uh, we'll never know for sure. Did they get to the cockpit? Always get that question. The FBI could not make that determination because the, the, the crash was so violent that the evidence was just smashed. Uh, so they, they couldn't make that determination. I think they did. It, it, I'll admit it maybe because I want them to have done it, but there are two things, circumstantial, granted. On the cockpit voice recorder near the end, as this is happening, the voices are, are marked as being very loud, loud shouts, loud. And the microphones were in the cockpit. So who hmm, they're, they're there, maybe banging down the door. But there's also an exchange on the voice recorder where uh, a, an English voice says, turn it up. And an Arabic voice says almost immediately, pull it down. Turn it up, pull it down. Turn it up, pull it down. This sounds to me like there's a struggle going on for the controls in the cockpit. I believe uh, that's what, what's happened. Again, it's all circumstantial evidence. But it's very late in the flight. In the final minute, as you can see on the animation of the flight path, the steering wheel or yoke turns very hard to the right, and the plane actually turns upside down in midair. Again, we'll never, one of the mysteries, we'll still never know why that happened. Uh, the two theories, either the passengers and crew were in there and they were fighting, and in the fight for control with, with the pilot, it, it turned and it turned, and the plane then turned upside down, or we know from the plotters that are still in Guantanamo that the hijacker told if they couldn't reach their target, they were supposed to crash the plane. Mohammed Atta, the overall leader and the man who flew the first plane into the World Trade Center, told the other hijackers if he could not reach the World Trade Center, he would have crashed his plane into the streets of New York City. It still would have caused terror and lots of damage. We don't know. But certainly it was, whether it was physical or not, it was the pressure of the passengers that drew coming with this counterattack that, that, that caused that to happen. Uh, at, at this point, though, Flight 93 is basically in a death spiral. At, at 10.03 and nine seconds, the last English voice is heard, a male passenger yells no. And at 10.03 and 11 seconds, Flight 93 crashes 
at 563 miles an hour, 40 degree angle upside down into an open field in Somerset County, Pennsylvania. Result is absolute devastation. The, the investigators believe from where they found the evidence that the front third of the plane, which hits at an angle, shattered, broke off, and flew into a grove of hemlock trees that was just beyond the crest. They found so much evidence, shattered evidence up in those trees. The bottom two thirds of the plane went into the ground. One FBI agent said it accordioned on top of one another. It was coming so fast, so violently. This is all you need to know. They found pieces of the plane 35 feet into the ground. They dug 40 just to make sure there was, there, there was uh, no more. Um, not much evidence was available. This is upper left is the only immediate photo after the, uh, after the crash. This is probably within a minute. It's from about a mile and a half away. Very difficult. I know at least one of you is a teacher. Very difficult for us when students come out to the memorial. They do not understand why there are not more photos. They do not understand that not only did everyone not have a cell phone, but none of us had cameras in our cell phones. They can't imagine that. So as we explain this story to a younger generation, imagine how Flight 93 in September 11th would have been reported 10 years later. We had cell phone cameras, we had social media, none of that was available back then. So a lady about a, uh, a mile and a half away said she felt the crash, not that she saw, she felt it. And she looked out her window, saw that, you know, that's the, from the, all the gasoline. Uh, fire. She took that photo above that barn and that dissipated probably in, in a minute or so. A uh, lower right corner obviously is, uh, is, is the crash site, the plane having gone into the ground right in front of those hemlock trees that I mentioned. Um, next is we have upper left is about a piece of the fuselage. That's about the biggest piece of the plane they found, just slightly bigger than the hood of a car. Lower right is the flight data recorder, one of the black boxes. One of the things I learned here is that black boxes are not black, they're orange so that you can see them in the water or see them in a, in a crater. They found the, both black boxes here with, uh, within a day or two. Not long after the crash, um, this became very much a Somerset County, Pennsylvania story, a small town America story. It was the family members know it was different here because of, of where it happened. This is not New York City. This is not Washington, D.C., the biggest cities, most powerful cities in the world. This is little Shanksville, Pennsylvania, population 245. The, these very rural people opened their hearts and homes to these people. You know, the coroners of New York City and Washington, D.C., they aren't used to things like this, but they're used to, to major stories. The coroner of Somerset County was a guy named Wally Miller, who was a local funeral director. He did 120 funerals a, a year. All of a sudden, uh, this national tragedy happens on his on his property, but the families know, they, they'll say they revere him. They say he treated them like he would treat any of his small town funeral customers. When he called, they called, he answered. They wanted to go to the site, he took them there. So very much a part of this story. My friends who looked at this book early on were surprised that there's uh, there seven or eight chapters after the crash. The story here does not end with the crash. There's, there's so much, it's a complex, interesting, uh, spine tingling, terrifying, maddening, inspiring story. Uh, from the FBI investigation to the, the local people being involved, to the families, very determined to, to get at the information, to the creation uh, in with, just within 10 years, very quick, of the National Memorial. Very quickly, uh, there were temporary memorials that they put up uh, in Shanksville. The local folks just put up that fence. People would hang things. They would empty those fences every Sunday night. By the next weekend, it'd be full again. The Somerset County Historical Society has 60,000 items that people just leaving some tribute of themselves to the heroes of, of Flight 93. Some of those are, are on display today at the, at the museum out at the Flight 93 National Memorial. Now on the 10th anniversary, uh, they were able to very quickly, as, as it turns out, uh, get a memorial going. Uh, they wanted something for the families at that point. Here is the first part of the memorial. That is, uh, the, the white wall is the wall of names. There's a panel for each member of the passengers and crew. The gate there, as you see, made of hemlock wood, the grove of hemlock trees. And that, again, that long mowed path, there's a big sandstone boulder out there. And that is the approximate uh, site of the crash site. Now, on the 10th anniversary weekend, um, I went out there both days. Is before I had any idea to write a book. I was just out as an interesting citizen. This is about 100 miles from where I live in Pittsburgh. Uh, September 10th day, I'll never forget. Uh, on stage that day, were former President George Bush, George W. Bush, former President Bill Clinton, and the sitting vice president at the time, Joe Biden. 
So now looking back, there were three future former or future presidents of the United States on the stage in this little town, whatever, it doesn't matter what your politics are. You see three men at that level in state, you know, it, it's a powerful day. They know something really important to the country is happening. They all gave great speeches. Um, I, I, and I'm, I'm writing this book in 2012, 2013, long before Biden's going to run for president. I wrote in the book that I thought he did the best job of connecting with the families and I theorized it was because, as we know, now know, he, he knew tragedy himself. He, he, his first wife and young daughter were killed in the auto crash. So I think he, he could deal with them uh, on that level. And he also gave a great tribute um, uh, to the pastors and crew. We were then calling the first warriors and in, 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 uh, the first soldiers of the war on terror, on terror. He went back to the beginning of the country, Lexington and Concord, and quoted Captain John Parker as saying, if they mean to start a war, let it begin here. That was the tribute to these to the passengers and crew of Flight 93. I used to end my talks there, and then I, I thought, you know, only a hundred miles away from this is another South Central Pennsylvania town where something else very historic happened, Gettysburg, where I go a lot. I've since written two books on the Battle of Gettysburg. There was a, a monument dedication at Gettysburg in the 1880s by a hero of the battle, Union hero of the battle, named Joshua Chamberlain, very learned man, four-term governor of Maine when it was over. Uh, and he gave an amazing speech and he talked about why people go to these sites, why they go to battlefields, why do they go to memorials. And I'll try to get it right. Chamberlain said, in great deeds, something abides. On great fields, something stays. Forms change and pass, bodies disappear, but spirits linger to consecrate ground for the vision place of souls. And reverent men and women from afar, generations who know us not and we know not of, heart drawn to see where and by whom great things were suffered and done for them shall come to this deathless field to ponder and dream. That was very relevant at Gettysburg in the 1880s. It's just as relevant in Somerset County, Pennsylvania in 2022. I know Minnesota is a long way, but if you're ever coming through Pennsylvania, driving down the Pennsylvania Turnpike and you pass the Somerset exit, I really recommend you stop and see this and, and pay tribute to these folks. It, it, is a, it is a very special place. So thank you very much. And if anybody has any more questions, I'd be happy to uh, entertain them. Randall. Tom, that was remarkable. As I, I hadn't done that in a while. It's, you know, it, it, it's, it's such a, it was such an emotional book to write. I still get a tea. I, I will read some of the passages. And I, I, I was telling Randall, I had done this. You were a lot of talks last year on the 20th anniversary. You have to, sometimes when you're redoing your talk, you reread your book to remember some things. And, and there's still places that I know what's, I know what I wrote. Not only do I know what happened, I know what I wrote. It still brings a tear to my eye. It's that kind of story. And a lot of it is the family members and these local Somerset people and, and, and what they did and how, how we as Americans and they as small town Americans dealt with this. And the family members today still, they, I, they all say they know it was a different experience than the people in New York and D.C. just because it was small town America. But anyway, thank you, Randall. Yeah. I appreciate the comment. Um, and, and for those uh, our online audience, as I listened to, to Tom tell his story and kind of lean into the computer monitor to, to, to hear it with a sense of anticipation and urgency and passion for what he conveys, uh, your book reads the same way. So um, it, it, it's, it's clear that you wrote the book because the book it, it has the same pace and cadence as you do, as well it should, but it's, it's a compelling story that you tell and thank you for telling it. Um, uh, you, you make reference to the memorial here, the slide on the screen, um, and at the dedication on the 10th anniversary, uh, there was a U.S. flag that was um, raised there. Can you tell us about that flag? I'm going to tell you, I, don't, I'll, I, I think the thing I've learned in my career in communications is when you don't so, know, say, I don't know. I don't know the flag story. I, 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 can you tell I, us about the flag? Sure. Well, I, I can only because I think you at least made passing mention of it. Um, that the flag that was raised on that day with those presidents there on site um, was the flag that did fly over the Capitol on 9-11. There, 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 there are so many um, little connections there that sometimes people, you know, you, you find out about this and, and you find even when you look at the architect and what he did, the, the thought that goes into this, that, that people don't ever really see or remember, but that is, that is one point. And also um, two of the FBI agents who worked the case from the very beginning 
raised that flag. So there's always been a, a feeling that the people who were involved there, whether that be family members or first responders or local fire or whatever, are still very much a part of this memorial. It's a living memorial. And the one thing I hear a lot, because in the, in the summers, we get a lot of people coming back from D.C. They're coming back through Pennsylvania to go to Ohio or Michigan or wherever they're going. Uh, and they stop here. And, and they say the feeling is the same as the Vietnam Memorial. And, and I agree. It, it has that kind of feeling. The difference being the Vietnam Memorial is in the mall in Washington. This is actually where the crash happened. This is where it happened. And you feel that when you're there. And it's, it's the same thing as walking a, you know, a Civil War battlefield. I think when you're there, you sense what's going on. And that, on that image, folks, you see the, 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 the stone out there, the sandstone boulder. And I think it's going to be this way for another generation. Only the family members can go all the way out to the actual crash site. The public, you can see the walkway, the public can get to about 75 yards. I think it's just, it's so recent for that first generation family member. That's their graveyard. So only, now in the research, obviously very early in the morning, the Park Service folks took me out there and into the woods and found, you know, found some data. But it, it, it's a, it's an eerie part of that site. And, and uh, visitors are always just enthralled whenever a family member is there. Whenever a family member shows, shows up, they can go out there anytime they want. So I, I think probably in 50 years or so, um, the public will be able to go out there like, like on a Civil War battlefield. But I think it's just so close for that first generation that it's, a, it's, it's kind of, I, 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 I like it. I think it's, it's appropriate. You can get close enough, but only the families can, can still go out. And the, they do good. The only time they use that path is on the, the anniversary of 7th, September 11th. They'll open that gate and all the family members will, will walk out and have a little ceremony out the, out the border. And, and you mentioned in your book, uh, you know, Wally Miller um, being overwhelmed with the, the prospect of what he was dealing with, but also, you know, applying uh, some, some basic research to identifying, uh, to tracking, to identifying the 40 bodies and how much even those 40 bodies would weigh and how much they recovered in the way of human remains and understanding why you can't access maybe some of the spaces um, a lot of it was everybody was able to be identified through DNA, but there was such a small amount that survived the crash that yes. it hallowed ground. Yeah, it, yeah. Most of mo, as as Wally said, most of the remains are out there. You know, most and a lot of them were, as he said, the FBI agents were were basically vaporized. They didn't find much, um, but he was he was determined. He was very determined. Uh, to the best of his ability to get DNA to, to identify it. It took till December. So it took from September to December. So they finally got uh, the, the, the final passenger. And, and so he was able to at least give that closure uh, to the, to the family members. Um, one of your earlier slides, you had the flight path and there was the notation on there, um, you know, 18 minutes to DC um, any sort of observation, having put in all the research and time into this book about what those 18 minutes might have meant? Oh, uh, you know, I just, I, every time I go past the Capitol, every time I'm in D.C., I go past the Capitol. I mean, that was the target. We're 99.9% we're, we're sure that's the target. It makes sense. The guys in Guantanamo say that. And it would have been easy to pick out from the sky. For the debate of whether bin Laden wanted the White House. We know that. Um, but the hijackers determined that the White House was not distinctive enough to pick out from the sky, and the Capitol was. Imagine if they'd crack. The, I don't know that anything symbolizes American democracy more than the U.S. Capitol had had a plane. You know, the, the, it was such a demoralizing day it was that would have just been devastating uh, to the country, and and just you know to, to have a chance where these people rose up and. And we're able to stop it. But again, one thing I, I do try to say, I'm glad you mentioned this, it veers me off to another direction. When I talked about the delay earlier, the delay in them taking off allowed those phone calls to happen and they got information. I like to say the people on the first three flights were no less brave. They just didn't know. It happened so fast that they had no way of knowing. Because of the delay in, in the plane taking off from Newark, just Newark airport traffic, and the delay in these guys high, taking long, they were supposed to, to hijack the plane. By the time they're in the air and making calls, they're hearing the two planes hit the World Trade Center. They're hearing that the plane is hit the Pentagon. So they knew they had to do something. They knew what was going to go on. So they were able, it, it doesn't, it, it, it's, it's remarkable that they were able to do what they do. But I think when we look at the first three flights, the, those people, uh, the Al Qaeda plan worked uh, 
worked there because they had no idea what was going on. Um, they were they were told they were going back to the airport. So um, I, I I still always every time I go out there I just I it, it Wally Miller said this in one of the services. He said I can't imagine what it must have been like in the cabin during those ten or twelve minutes when they're trying to figure out what's going on because you know there were people who were debating every you know you can you can't get 40 people to agree on anything so we can't this our group can't so you know there are all sorts of debates yet in that brief period of time they came to that conclusion that this is what they were going to do and uh i just i, I stand in awe of that yeah if you know if they had deliberated any longer yeah it's remarkable yeah yeah yeah. And, and, you know, it, it hit an open field that was a was trip mine, but it was right on line with the Shanksville school. You know, if it's if it's in the air two or three more seconds, who knows? You know, it, it just so happened it hit an open field. This could even if it hits a small town in rural Pennsylvania, just more devastation. You know, this was the one flight where no one on the ground was 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 killed or even injured. Um, so there, 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 there's that part of the story as well. Uh, a, a, another question from uh, the chat. Uh, um, were the pilots uh, both killed? We believe so. We don't know. They certainly were incapacitated. Um, interesting uh, part of this flight is, again, with the cockpit voice recorder, at one point, uh, Zia Jara, the hijacker pilot, who was having trouble bringing the plane back in, he says, bring the pilot back in here. You could easily speculate that maybe one of the pilots, you know, was, was stabbed and wounded and laying bleeding, but was still alive. But the, a pilot was never mentioned again. So whatever happened, uh, that nothing, nothing else was said beyond that. Certainly they were incapacitated. And this worked, that, that, that was the plan on all four flights. Uh, they got the pilots out of the cockpits and, and the hijacker pilots uh, took over. There was a, you know, a report on Flight 93 that they saw two men laying in first class. They were probably, had, probably had been pulled out of the cockpit and, and, and laid there. So uh, they, they certainly were not, it would, would not have been in a position uh, at all to be part of a counterattack uh, or, or else they would have been part of taking, you know, taking back control of the plane. So uh, again, a lot of this we can only speculate, but that's pretty well informed speculation, either, either killed or, or uh, severely incapacitated. Uh, thank you, Tom. Um, you know, we'll, we'll wrap up uh, and we're going to hear from Wynn Anderson here in just a moment uh, with a little Q&A just as we tackle the topic of, of teaching this in schools, right? Um, so it's, it's meant to be kind of an open open forum for a few minutes here in, in just a couple seconds. But, um, you know, I, again, uh, I encourage you, Tom, to you know read some of the chats too when you have a chance here in a yeah. moment, just because uh, people are I right, really appreciate your comments and in, in all because it's well deserved. But um, you, you made mention of uh, you know Joe Naki, uh, one of those six figures identified in the photos that you mentioned. And in your book, you quote his brother Kenny, um, and, and in that quote that you attribute to, to Joey's brother Kenny, um, he says, "I lost my brother, but everyone in the nation lost something that day. The loss was great for everyone." And then you follow up after that um, with a kind of remarkable statement that I thought really encapsulates what we all did lose. But you go on to say immediately after that, 9-11 uh, personal tragedy merged with public trauma. Everyone was connected and everyone shared in the grief. So I just thought that was uh, some, some sharp writing on your part that really does capture that we all lost something that day. Um, you know, some, some more than others, but the, the nation lost something. We each individual lost something that day. And, and you know, people like Kenny Naki, the Nackies are one of the families that they're out there all, you know, they're hugely involved in that. And, and it does, you know, as, as a writer, you get inspired when you talk to people like that, you know, the, just the fortitude and, and the, the determination to keep their brother's memory alive. So uh, it's just in, in, interesting. Uh, it, 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 we were talking earlier, rather, it is interesting that for the folks who aren't on, because we often get asked about the family members. And I say it's about a third, a third, a third. A third of them are living their lives for the memorial. A third come back on occasion. And a third, it's 20 years now, a third have moved on. And we all handle grief differently. 
Uh, and that's totally understandable, but thankfully for people like the Mackies, because they are, they're kind of the heart and soul of driving them, driving the memorial. It's, it's unusual that we have, you know, a, a, again, a contemporary memorial. We won't always have those first generation family members around, but we have them now. And, and, uh, they're a huge asset to understanding this story. Last question for you, Tom. Um, why did you take this on as a, a topic? Uh, because nobody else would. It was one of those, I wanted to read this book. Uh, I was very, you know, it, obviously a lot of us, I was really very affected by, by September 11th. Uh, and this flight, this crash did happen about 100 miles from where I live. So I, I, I felt kind of a, a, a kinship. I would go out there to Somerset County. And there was nothing in the first couple of years. Um, and I was just surprised over the years that no one had written anything. And it kind of bothered me that no one had written anything. And then I found out that they had, the, the volunteers out there had, had collected all these oral histories of family members and first responders and FBI agents. Um, but they were just sitting there in a file and they're public material. So I said, I'm just going to give this a shot. And there were, there were a couple of publishers who liked the idea, but even in 2012, 2013, thought it was too close. For some reason, people kind of didn't want to deal with this, but they found the publisher who wanted to do it. And, and then uh, there, were, there were times that anybody who's written, <laughs> uh, you get writer's block and you hit the wall and you're going to give up and you're going to throw your laptop in the river. And, and uh, the, the thing that kept me going, though, was that if you don't do this, no one else is trying to do it either. The story has to be told. So it you know, should have been done by some greater historian than me. But since nobody wanted to do it, I uh, I uh, I. I, I stepped up and I'm, I'm, I'm proud of what it accomplished. I hope someday, you know, we all, everybody hopes that somebody builds on their work, hope someday somebody can do a, an updated story of Flight 93. Maybe they find some more information or a different perspective. But uh, for now though, this, is, this has been the only one and it, it, it stands there. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I stuck it out. <laughs> well, thank you for writing it, Tom. Thank you. Uh, Rand, you, want me to you want me to hang on to listen or? Yeah, please do. Uh, if I, I'm going to take my take my screen back. But yes, please stick with us if you can for okay. another yeah. 15 minutes or so. Thank you. And if anybody has you no know, follow up comments for for Tom again, you know, feel free to use that that chat function uh, and follow up with him directly. And to move us forward, just a few brief comments, and we'll uh, hear from Wynne Anderson and her efforts to educate young people about this topic, which is uh, an effort almost equal to Tom's, I think, um, in the way of importance, if, if not even greater, perhaps. Um, but uh, just to kind of make quick mention of a, a few things. Um, one, this is an ongoing effort of the museum. Um, we created a project, uh, Resolute Minnesota's of Minnesota Stories of 9-11 and the War. And, and tap some key storytellers in addition to many more folks to, to capture these stories of that morning and the 20 year war that followed. Um, certainly appreciate the support from the state of Minnesota, from MDVA and the legacy folks to, to make some of this happen uh, and to provide funding. Um, this initiative uh, and hearing from Tom and we've heard from other uh, uh, authors and experts and, and most importantly, veterans uh, in this format in the past, but we've done documentary films, a traveling exhibition, a curriculum we'll hear about in just a moment uh, in virtual programs. Uh, we did do a documentary uh, that was called that same thing, Resolute Minnesota Stories of 9-11 and the War. It did premiere last fall uh, statewide uh, and is currently available on the museum's YouTube channel. It's a 45 minute documentary. Uh, it does talk about Tom Burnett, uh, and we hear from Mariah Jacobson, uh, his daughter uh, is one of those that we feature in the documentary. Um, the traveling exhibit uh, is one that we did open up in St. Paul uh, last September on the anniversary uh, on the steps of the state capitol. Um, we'll be in Duluth this week um, at the um, St. Louis County Historical Society and headed to Mankato State University uh, in September. Uh, and there's just a few images of our exhibit that we're sharing statewide. 
Uh, Flight 93, you see there on the right, uh, something that Tom does make mention of in his book uh, is that plaque, uh, an image of the plaque that's at the state capitol and was dedicated uh, is there as part of the exhibit you see on the right hand side there. Uh, there's a plaque that uh, is an honor uh, of the um, passengers of Flight 93 uh, saving the capitol and that's was installed in the capitol itself. It's a terribly moving piece if you've had the chance to see it. Um, trying to bring young people to this exhibit and then giving uh, veterans a chance to identify the places where they have fought in the global war on terrorism. Uh, at the center of that exhibit is an actual fragment from the World Trade Center. There's about a dozen sites in Minnesota that have fragments of various sizes. Uh, this was one that was loaned to us uh, and is uh, again gives people a chance to really kind of identify with um, the aftermath of what started it all as the exhibit tries to explore the full 20 year reach of this um, conflict. And certainly great to have uh, Tom be the latest of our, our presenters. So uh, appreciate your, your time today, Tom, and, and a terrific book uh, and a terrific contribution to our project. So I, I thank you very much. Um, and with that, um, Wynn Anderson uh, has been taking on uh, the charge effort um, to tell the story um, to Minnesotan students. Um, Wynn Anderson, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, please. Hello, everyone. Um, well, I am a transplanted Minnesota Minnesotan. I'm a very proud North Dakotan. Been here for a long time. I've been teaching social studies full time for the last 10 years after several years of substitute teaching and then a long 10 year break um, to raise my kids. I graduated from the University of Minnesota with a degree in history, later got my teaching credentials and then got my master's degree in 2018 after uh, four years of studying the United States Constitution. So that is, my, that is my passion. I teach government and AP government at a central Minnesota high school of about 1300 students, Sock Rapids, Sock Rapids Rice High School near St. Cloud. Well, thanks, Wynn, for taking this on. It's it's a uh, we. I think we appreciate. It. I know. I know we all appreciate it. It's, it's terribly important. And and there's some headwind um, to doing this, though. I imagine, and and one of them must be um, September, uh, as we hear accounts. Mariah Jacobson uh, talks about being a high school student um, on 9/11, which was just after the school year starts. So. Um, you know, how does the anniversary pose challenges for for educators to, to get this taught because it's on, you know, the, it's a, you know, the first week or two of school, we get hit with 9-11. That could be, you know, one of the top two obstacles to teaching 9-11 is just teachers are in a different mode at the beginning of the year. And it's, it's, it's chaotic at the beginning of the year. And teachers all have their own individual ways about how they want to start class and some might spend three, four, five days on classroom environment. Others might jump right in. Um, some years, depending upon when Labor Day falls, 9-11 will be, I teach only seniors. So some days, some years, 9-11 is literally the second or third day that I have my students. Now, I don't care. I believe in teaching 9-11. So <laughs> the syllabus be damned if we have to do that another day or we have to shift stuff around. I do that, but that is not something that I would say most teachers do. And so one big priority I would have is if we want teachers to teach 9-11, we have got to get information to them in the spring. And we also need some very timely reminders to admin. We, I think we really need admin to help us push 9-11 and say, hey, can we at least get a day? And, and so yes, the calendar is, is a big impediment. Mm -hmm. Which is which is a shame, but uh, teaching can be a more rigid thing than than you might think. Yeah. So what what is uh, you know I I we have I suppose a perception of what student awareness the awareness of young people is, but you're somebody who's actually in the classroom. Um, can you kind of characterize or give a sense of what you? How would you characterize the student awareness of 9-11, what happened and what resulted? 
Well, excuse me, my dog is whining. Um, my, I teach only seniors and I, as I, I'm appalled by the lack of, of understanding now, and maybe that's just the way things go now, but you know, well, I wasn't born then. So I find that the kids who know about 9-11 know about it from their own, their own families. know somewhat about 9-11, but a lot of them have no idea anything happened outside of New York City. Mm -hmm. So with each year, it gets worse. And with each year, my instruction of 9-11 has to back up basically to here's what happened. And I wish that I could go deeper with my regular classes. But my goal at least is to transmit the rudimentary information. Now with my AP classes, that's a college level class, it's better because those kids are more in tune with things, they're willing to challenge themselves. So we can make deeper connections about civil liberties and, and foreign policy and, and things like that. But for most students, it's it's bare bones. And I mean you're 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 teaching young people who weren't alive at the time. And, you know, already, you know, nationally, there's you know, some 60 million Americans with no living memory of 9-11. Uh, and that number, of course, is getting bigger every single day. And, and uh, it, it's, it's remarkable the kind of challenges that are faced because those of us who did live through it have such a strong connection to it. And if you didn't, I can imagine it's an uphill battle. Right. But I think it also kind of speaks to modern education I was born in 1970, but I still learned about, I still knew about D-Day, you know, when I, when I was growing up, but again, family connections and, and prioritizing history and current events and politics in the household, that to me is kind of the dividing line now about who knows stuff and who doesn't know stuff. Every now and then I'll get a political junkie or history junkie, junkie kid, but, but not very often. So um, it, it, it's very much an uphill battle. I apologize. I have the world's worst dog. <laughs> no worries, when. Right. I won't let him out again. So um, with all that, you, you, you have taken on the task of developing a curriculum um, that's kind of still being worked on a little bit. But tell us, tell us the framework. Um, what was your approach? Well, the museum very generously offered me the opportunity to work on a curriculum. So what I tried to do was create a five lesson curriculum that could be that you could pick and choose. So if teachers just want to do a bare bones intro to 9-11, there's a standalone lesson on that. Then there are standalone lessons on different phases. Um, the, the second phase is introducing students to Minnesotans involved in 9-11. We hear from Scott Wallace, who was in the tower, and he just has this amazing first person account of what it was like and how he got down. And he also that night in his hotel room, he wrote what I saw on 9-11 and he's got that transcribed, which is a great resource for students. It's, it's fascinating. Um, a Minnesota Air National Guard guy was, in the air, I think ferrying a plane back to Minnesota and happened to be, um, isn't, I think that he's the one, his plane saw, you know, saw flight 93. Yeah. And um, of course we have uh, Mariah Jacobson's, ex, you know, and we don't, and my students don't know at that point that she is the biological daughter of Tom Burnett Jr. So we kind of try to um, have a little drama in our, in our lessons. Um, Dr. Andrew Baker, who was the um, forensic pathologist at the Pentagon, who ends up having to do, you know, pathology on all of these people. So try to introduce people to Minnesotans in 9-11. But again, all, each lesson is standalone. There's homework assignments that can be assigned prior and afterward. There are transcripts. So I try to make sure that teachers who have different emphases have something that they can that they can pull. If you just want to watch the videos and, and watch that, great. But if you want to have more reading and writing, you can do that as well. Then the third lesson is called Boots on the Ground. And that's when we really talk about Minnesotans in Iraq and Afghanistan. And there's very compelling 
video um, that you guys acquired. Um, lesson four continues that. It's called the Long War, helping students to understand this is America's longest war and try to help them understand the toll that takes on the country and um, on the people involved. Lesson five is remembrance and legacy, trying to um, help students really understand that toll in just very vivid terms. Uh, Jill Stevenson's son, Ben Kopp, her story and Ben's story uh, is just an absolute heartbreaker, but also so, just so inspiring. Um, I use that with my students on 9-11 and there, there was uh, hardly a dry eye in the room, even among stoic high school boys. Um, so that, tr try, to have a, try to have a timeline that gets us kind of from beginning to end, but you can dip in and out. Ideally, what I'd like to see schools do is, okay, we're gonna use with, with our freshman class. Um, so you get freshmen, we're gonna teach them what 9-11 was. Next year, they're sophomores. Let's do another lesson. The, the thing students hate above all, oh, I already learned that, you know, students can't stand that. So mm -hmm. I like, even though they haven't learned it, but I like the idea of, of having, okay, now you can teach them a different, a different piece of the puzzle. Now you can dip in more here or there. Maybe you've got kids who are really interested in the, in the military aspects of it. You can go that direction. So, uh, and relying upon some some primary sources, I mean, the museum uh, and the state task force, you know, conducted a series of of interviews, and those interviews are ongoing. We we are still gathering more and more stories, but uh, you've gone in, reviewed those videos, and then pulled out sections that speak to the lesson plan themselves. And now we've gone back and edited those videos so you can just watch the segments that you kind of call out and and those will be posted on our website so the curriculum you developed will be all all digital for sure uh for easy access and, and viewing and and getting exactly to the point in those interviews that that you call out so uh trying to make this as as efficient as possible and um it's kind of a Sisyphean effort, I suppose, in, in some ways. Um, but uh, I don't know. Maybe you and I and, and others can be inspired by by Tom, uh, who makes the point that no one else is going to write the book, um, and thank God he did. And and nobody else seems to be writing the curriculum uh, for the state of Minnesota, at least. And I appreciate you uh, being that person who takes this on um, uh, sincerely. Well, thank you. I was happy to do it. And 9-11 for my generation is what I imagine Pearl Harbor was to my grandparents' generation. So um, it, and now, and now I'm going to be a real Debbie Downer here. Um, my own three children go to, went to a different school than the one I teach at. But every year on 9-11, I'd say to my kids, so tell me what you learned today. And eventually as they got older, they knew where I was going. And my kids would say, no, mom, no one mentioned 9-11. And I'd say, even in U.S. history, no one mentioned 9-11. Nope, mom, no one mentioned it. So it is, in some cases, more dire than you think. And then other times I'll hear kids say, yeah, my science teacher told me something, you know, different students. Um, but the, the calendar is a big thing. And then the other thing that I think is a serious concern is that a lot of teachers are young. You know, we have nine social studies teachers at, at our school. Three of them are 26 years of age or younger. I mean, they were six years old when 9-11 happened. You know, it's not, frankly, it's not that big a deal to them, even though it should be because their whole generation was shaped by it. And then I, I think there is an element of political correctness out there and um, some worry in Minnesota um, especially where I live um, in St. Cloud, we have large numbers of Somali students. And I think there are teachers who are afraid to tackle the subject of Islamic terrorism, even though we're talking, you know, we're talking about different things. I think that is that of which we do not speak. That That is a real thing out there, I think. Well, and it's good for us to hear from someone who's in the classroom uh, and in contact with other teachers to really understand what those dynamics are. The, the age of some teachers 
terribly enlightening for me. Um, the fact that your, your kids who come back from other schools and you quiz them, what did you hear? Aren't, aren't hearing much. Um, that that's, you know, it's, it's one thing that they think that might be happening, but they have somebody kind of with the anecdotal perspective, at least to say, this is what your experience is, um, is motivating, um, I believe for others. And so I appreciate you being the conduit to helping us better understand the challenges that are there. Um, and, and I'd come across some research suggesting that there's just a handful of states that actually require 9-11 to be taught. Can you speak to that at all? You know, I did a little, little research as well. I found, you know, like Oklahoma because of their Oklahoma City bombing, um, a, a few other states. Um, and I downloaded Minnesota Social Studies Standards again today just to make sure I wasn't, um, you know, mouthing off and I kept doing, you know, I went through all of the standards and I didn't see anything about 9-11. And I don't know if in the, from what I've read about the revised standards, I haven't heard anything either. So that is, yeah, if, it, if it's not, if it's not required, then some schools, now, now my school fortunately gives teachers a lot of latitude, but some schools, it is standards-based curriculum. You have to have a standard strand for every single lesson and if it's not in the curriculum it it is not taught so I, I think i think across the state of minnesota you would have quite a bit of variation but if it's not in the standards then there's there's absolutely no guarantee so that's that's not good news either now on the upside i think there are a ton of things that could be done that would really help push 9-11 being taught. A, kids are fascinated by it. I mean, it's, it's as, as horrible and tragic as it is, it's fascinating. Kids really get into it and they love to hear the backstory. Most students have no understanding of, of terrorism and, and, you know, the whole, you know, all, I mean, you can, you can quickly go down rabbit holes, the Middle East here and there. I mean, you can go you can go back to World War I for Pete's sake if you want to. There's, kids are interested. That's the really good news. So once you get them into it, they, they want to go with it and the class really goes well. I think, you know, you've got those, you've got the, the, the traveling exhibits. You're going to have this beautiful new museum. There are, you know, field trips that could be done. They're now with Zoom, even though you know my opinion on Zoom, if you could have one of your people who you interviewed on camera zoom into a classroom, which would be easy enough to do that, I think would spark a lot of interest. And I think you would get a lot of teacher buy-in. So there are a lot of opportunities to change, to change this and make it better. Well, it's a huge task, but uh, at least from where I sit, um, hearing from Tom and Wynn tonight, um, gives us some momentum, I would, I would argue, um, to keep up the fight, uh, to know that it's a fight worth fighting and how important it is, and to have folks like the two of you and with the talents and passion that you have um, makes me more confident that, that we'll, we'll do what needs to be done. So um, really appreciate everybody joining us tonight. Um, and uh, we'll certainly be in touch. We'll be offering future programming. Uh, you'll, we'll hear from Wynn again. Um, come and see us uh, in Duluth this weekend. Uh, do pick up Tom's book. It's a compelling read um, for sure. And I, I suppose that as Wynn did mention, um, do understand that uh, this traveling exhibit and all the scholarship that's gone into it um, will morph into a permanent gallery space in a new Minnesota Military and Veterans Museum to open in a couple of years at Camp Ripley. Uh, Camp Ripley, where so much of Minnesota's response to the global war on terrorism uh, has flowed from uh, due to the service members, men and women who have uh, served with distinction uh, since 9-11, as was mentioned um, in the claustrophobic cabin of United Flight uh, 93 uh, was Tom Burnett, you know, on the front line in that global war on terrorism. So I appreciate everybody joining us this evening. Uh, be well and stay in touch. Thank you. Thank you.